Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome to um, our access chat for today. Um, we're very excited about this topic. We have Lauren Stork from CCAC and our topic is about captioning. And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, in a moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren and let her talk to you about why what we're doing today is different from anything we've ever done on Access Chats. Uh, Antonio, my partner, is with me from Ireland, and I am joining from Virginia. And Neil is on holiday today, so he was not able to join um, this very progressive interview that we're about to do. And so we're really thrilled to have Lauren Stork on our show today, and she's joining us from Maine. So Lauren, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about why we're so excited about having you as our guest today. Uh, thank you, Deborah. I'm I'm really honored to be invited and included. It's you, you, all of you are so active, doing wonderful things with access and inclusion in the digital world. And I'm not technical at all. I'm a peop more of a people person. So I'm not sure. You want me to just tell a little bit about my background, or yes, please. Um, and also tell us about L Lauren. Tell us about um, the video captioning that's happening in Rochelle, and it, it just you know tell us the entire story about uh, what's happening today, if you don't mind. Thank you, and sorry oh, to interrupt you. Oh, okay. This this is um, I don't know if you've interviewed uh, for hard of hearing people before, but um, with thanks to a captioning company. Um, called Caption Access, and Rochelle Hopkins is our live captioner today. So on this video, when you see me look over to the left of my laptop, I'm reading what everybody is saying real time, because I, I hear, I am, I am deafened, and um, I, I hear people speaking, but I have no comprehension of what they're saying. So I require live captioning like this for a lot of meetings and other things. And um, I think this is the first time that, that you're doing this too, I think. So thank you very much for doing it. Um, I don't know, just by introduction, I, I am a retired psychologist. I have um, practiced. Uh, I have a doctorate in licensing in the States and in England and I worked in the States for a long time and in London for nine years a long time ago and I was not hard of hearing then and um, in, in later middle age my hearing started to go down and I lost most of my hearing over 12 years. Um, it, it's an inherited condition, one of many hundreds of different kinds of hearing loss. I didn't know I was going to inherit it though. So um, I was, uh, I became very interested and active in a number of hearing loss groups and learning about deaf uh, groups also that is sign language users. But um, most of us who are who have acquired hearing loss don't know sign language and don't learn sign language. We require captioning. Mm -hmm. And five years ago, I realized I, 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 I started the CCIC organization, which is a captioning advocacy group. It's captioning advocacy. Um, it's not a hearing loss group. But of course, many of us uh, have a hearing loss, but there are so many other groups that benefit from captioning also. People who use sign language are probably among the smallest group, but they need captioning on all media, including all media on the internet. And we work together for that. And a lot of other people need captioning also. It's, it's helpful for people with autism, people with tinnitus and no hearing loss, people with language differences, people all around the world who want to learn English. Having captioning in another language helps you understand 
and learn that language and, and a few other reasons also. So I started the CCIC with five or six friends, colleagues. That was five years ago. And now we have over 800 members around the world. And it's all online. And uh, we have occasional meetings as I travel because I do a lot of traveling. But uh, it's really online. It's a wonderful, supportive information group where um, we try to encourage everyone to do local, national, and international captioning advocacy. How's that? <laughs> that sounds, That's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> and like, like you, you were mentioning the captioning, and I just, I just opened a window on my screen, and I, I'm sharing part of the caption window. It's not perfect, but my purpose is to show uh, uh, how it's done. So at, at the moment, I'm in the call with Laura and Deborah. I, I'm sharing my screen, and you're able to see myself and a separate window where the caption is running s simultaneously. So this is uh, running on a website and we are doing the Twitter, the, the chat and uh, with Lauren uh, using Skype uh, at the same time. Well, that's really super. Uh, thank you, because now I don't have to turn my head back and forth as much. <laughs> thank you, Antonio. My pleasure. Thank you. I think what's so exciting about uh, having you as our guest, Lauren, and I will tell you that to date you are our first deafened guest, and it's and the reason why is because uh, believe it or not, um, we have not been in existence that long. Access Chat started in um, the middle of December. And it has just gained so much traction, and we're we're just thrilled with the results we're getting. But um, I invited you to participate. Uh, gosh, I think in February, and then we just had to nail down the dates and everything else. But we um, we believe that if you're going to be talking about access and full inclusion of everybody, including people with disabilities, you cannot leave out a huge segment of our population. And as you noted, captioning is valuable to all of us. I know um, my husband is losing his hearing, and that is also genetic. And I have a daughter that's 28 years old that has Down syndrome, and she uses captioning to help her understand content better on the internet and on television and stuff. So um, society really benefits from captioning, and I'm looking forward to seeing more uh, technological benefits to captioning um, so that so that we have less resistance to people wanting to caption things on um, the internet and l live streaming and videos and TV. And so um, I think that the work that you're doing at CCAC is amazing. Um, you had mentioned something before we got started about uh, Rochelle, where you talked about in the United States that we call her a captioner, but in the UK we call her um we have a different name for what she's providing. Do you mind addressing that, Lauren? Because that was something that was new to me. Well, um, actually in the UK, the UK um, has its own term for this. It's called a speech to text reporter, STTR. And as far as, and, and that, that term is used in some other countries. Speech to text STT is kind of a generic for what captioning is. Um, in Europe, in the United States, the, uh, our captioner today and others are called captioners, um, captioning providers. But in, in a lot of Europe, especially Northern Europe, Germany, and the Scandinavian countries, they are called text interpreters and I've been pushing for us to, to, to say text interpreter in the states too but that will never happen. I like, I like text interpreter instead of sign language because it sort of evens the field. Um, a lot of the public and properly so 
recognize sign language and love to watch samples of it when it's done well. And the, the problem is that when we say we're deaf or hard of hearing, a lot of people assume that we use sign language also. And most of us don't because we've, we, we live in the hearing world. And it, it's hard to make captioning as a topic as we say, as sexy as sign language. I mean, sign language also has enormous um, power and is needed in so many places where it's lacking. But captioning, captioning doesn't grab attention the way the way sign language does. And part of the CCA mission is to also figure out, you know, how to advocate more strongly. We can use all the new ideas anyone might anyone can send us about you know explaining how how it's it's our life it's life saving for so so many millions of people a billion or more globally it's a captioning it's it's more than just text under a picture or even more it's it's social interaction communication which we've lost by losing our ears functioning, we, we need communication as human beings. So one of, one of my CCA members, when I asked them to tell me what to say today, they said, we, we humans are social. And she said, we die a thousand death, deaths. We die a thousand deaths if we cannot communicate with other humans. So captioning for me I, is is language and it, it's so important, but to get that message out to people is not always easy. Sometimes it's very hard. You know, for example, they, they say, well, we'll just send you a transcript or just have someone <laughs> take notes. And that that's very different. Thank you very much. I can read a million pages of transcript and books and that's just not the same as live interaction. And taking notes is a good substitute sometimes. But for those of us who want to catch every word and who love words, we don't want to miss anything. We want to, we want to see your nice smile or we want to see your frown if I say something ridiculous. And we want to interact with you the best way we can. So captioning is our language. So, uh, Lauren... Uh, you know... Uh, when, go ahead, Antonio. When, when somebody uh, invites you to go to, for a talk or, or for a conference, uh, is it possible to have these cap this captions in the big screen that everybody at that conference can actually see uh, uh, the, the, the whole speech? Is that how it works? Yes, of course, it's possible. And many people um, for many years um, without re any relationship to hearing loss have had live captioning at major international meetings all around the world. Business executives, if it's a large conference, they've had live captioning um, projected onto screens for many years. I think those of us who are more active in captioning advocacy um, have become much more vocal, I think, over the last five years, building on previous work done maybe only for the last 20 years or 25 years with the ADA celebration coming up. But um, it's easy to ask for it, but you have to usually advocate quite strongly to convince a conference that they should be inclusive, that, uh, that it's their obligation to pay for it. And, and that's the rub. And one of the CCAC programs is now is we're actually offering um, three hours of paid conference captioning to people. But believe it or not, I can't give it away 
I, I need, you know, we're all volunteers in the CCIC and we've been contacting various conferences that, that have not, that have not scheduled captioning. And it's, it's a lot of work to try to market what we're doing so that we raise awareness and provide conferences with captioning. So, you know, that, that's one of our advocacy programs that we, the fundraising we've done, I have some funding to start this and we have helped four or five small meetings so far um, get started using live captioning. It's not only live conferences, it's also um, so many meetings, so many community meetings that people want to go to. And people with hearing loss have isolated themselves. They're, they've stopped going out to lectures in their community that, and that is so unhealthy. So, you know, we tried to um, give them a little more courage to ask for captioning and then to advocate for it because it's a long process, as you all know, to advocate for anything, for advocate to get something introduced the first time. So we are talking here, we are talking uh, over Skype Let's say that uh, we are, you know, we are. Uh, let's an example that we are a family, where uh, this could be useful to to put in contact, you know, kids w with their old with with their elderly. Uh, uh, how how can that technology also be available in these type of situations? Yes. Um, again, it it's. Um, letting families know that it's possible. There's a lot of education and raising awareness to do. And then um, if they want a live captioner as good as Rochelle is doing for us today, um, there is a cost. And, um, you know, but uh, families use Skype, video Skype chats like this more and more. I do it with my family, but even, even for me, you know, setting up the schedule to find a live captioner and then paying for it each time feels, can feel like a burden. So it, it's, it's a dilemma because professionals deserve to get paid for quality work. And the CCIC always says that. At the same time, a lot of people ask us about machine captioning, you know, automatic machine captioning. Well, for some voices, that works okay. For other voices, it's just terrible. So that machine captioning, even with all the new technologies coming out every, every week almost, it's not good enough yet. And I don't know if it'll ever be good enough for full quality and really important conversations not only with your family, but with medical professionals, for example. Um, but, you know, I think most people don't even know they can do this yet. And it doesn't cost a whole lot of money. For companies, it does not break the bank at all. And it has to be built in like, like your group is doing such a, a wonderful job um, discussing how access needs to be designed from day one in inclusive um, systems for people with differences have to be a first thought, you know, not an afterthought. And, and the same with live captioning for anyone. Um, for, for a small group with, without a lot of money, you know, they have, we encourage them to do fundraising. We'll help them do fundraising if they need to. For a large company, it's a minuscule cost compared to what they spend for a, a large conference, for example. Thank you so much, Lauren. I'm sure Deborah has, another, has more questions. Um, thank you, Antonio. Lauren, I just attended a conference in Washington, D.C. last week called M-Enabling Summits, and it is a... Um, for for Rochelle, that's M dash E N A B E L I N G. Oh, she got it. Uh, she's really good. <laughs> um, but 
the and that's something it, it's a, a conference about accessibility and mobile and how mobile um you know how that's tying into aging and people with disabilities and so we um i'm a volunteer at uh, with G3 ICT, which is one of the uh, providers of the conference. And we want that conference to be fully accessible. And so we invite speakers that are deaf and speakers that are hard of hearing. We have, um, we, we have it fully captioned. Um, a lot of times, if a conference even thinks about it, we will see a conference provide captioning for the the main sessions, the the introductory sections, sessions, the keynote sessions. But we won't see the captioning happening in all of the other sessions. So I guess if you're deaf or hard of hearing, you just don't get access to that information. We also find it interesting that I, I had to learn that. If you have a panelist, for example, that is deaf, the um, sign language, we, we provide sign language interpreters and captioning, and you need sign language interpreters that are interpreting for the panelist, as well as another set of sign language interpreters that are interpreting for the audience, because we want to be fully accessible. Um, it, it's always interesting to watch um, how some people prefer the sign language and some prefer the captioning. And so understanding, well, you know, people are people. So understanding that it's really important to provide both. And if you're at a conference that is talking about accessibility and disability inclusion, and you're not fully accessible to people that are deaf, that is such a failure. And when we were trying to figure out how to do this with this very this pretty pretty big conference that I attended, I had started reaching out to other conferences that um, talk about these topics, and they're like, "Oh well, we don't ever have any deaf people attend." <laughs> and I thought, "Wow, do you understand? They're not attending because you don't make it accessible to them, and and we need their voices in here." So. I believe that what you're doing at CCAC, it's just so critical. And I would like you also maybe to address that I always feel very inadequate when I'm at these conferences because I I know just so little sign language and I feel like I should be better. I should know it better, but it's a whole language. And um, the captioning adds so much value to me as a participant, but there's also a huge issue, and you've addressed it a little bit, Lauren, about individuals and small little groups of people um, corresponding with each other. It, it, there's so much work to do that sometimes it must feel overwhelming. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, was that a question? <laughs> <laughs> a comment and a question. I, I, I just think it, it's so important that the work that your group is doing, because um, as we age, more of us acquire hearing loss, significant hearing loss. And I know that my husband's father is 90 and he is deaf now. And um, I see my husband losing his hearing significantly. And I, I know that I think it's very sad that when a person loses their hearing later in life, they, they become so isolated. And um, it, I just, I think the efforts th that you're making at CCAC to bring awareness and help everyone understand that this is not a nice to have. Corporations should not have any kind of management meetings or videos online or anything that's not fully accessible to all of us. It's so it's a there's a lot of awareness work to do. Yes, um, the last part hits on one of your interests and errors, which is you know full employment, better employment opportunities for people with disabilities, and it's. You know, it's a bit of a catch-22 situation until until people have the resources they need to be fully included. Um, you know, we we just get we just lose so much talent. Really, we lose these people, um, and they have a lot of skills, as you all know. 
I think the, the thing about sign language is, is a beautiful culture. And people who are born deaf do still feel more comfortable at a conference having interpreters there also. Um, and that, that's as it should be. I, I, I don't know, I hope I'm not saying the wrong thing, but as, as people who are born deaf are getting better and better educations now, I mean, so many more um, people with, who are born deaf are, are going on to all kinds of graduate studies and, and are getting better and better educations and becoming truly bilingual. And for a, a, a deaf person who is bilingual, for, for them that means fluent in sign language and also perfect native language, perfect English for we English speakers or whatever country they're in. And that, that, I think that's really changed dramatically over the last few years. And, and that's a good thing. So yes, if, if someone asks for a sign language, that, that must be in there for them. But if no one asks for it, um, most of these people mo most use captioning. And of course, captioning serves everybody in the audience, whether they're whether they're hard of hearing or deaf or not. Um, it's been shown in studies that hearing people attend better and learn better if there's quality captioning there. Also, um, there's another thing you said that was a, a very important. It's, it slipped, but. Um, it, for me, it does feel overwhelming, especially, you know, volunteer organizations. And I have I've been involved in many over, over my working career as a volunteer in different things. And, um, you know, the last, the last five years, especially with captioning advocacy, volunteers burn out and leaders of volunteer things burn out. So we, you know, we we always welcome um, new interest like this. We welcome new members all the time because those, you know, the new blood is so important in volunteer organizations, and so many disability groups are all volunteers, and you know, th there's some there's some um, tension there. There's some problems that sometimes it feels as if. Our volunteer nonprofits are, you know, going head to head with the corporations that we love and depend on for new technologies. And um, one of the things your group is doing seems to me one of the advantages is that you have corporate involvement also, of course, which is great. I wish we had that for the CCIC. Maybe we'll get there one day. Um, but also, one of the things we've been trying to do is, you know, collaborate and reach out more with other disability groups. You know, there, there are pros and cons of having so many different specialized groups. I think the CCIC was needed because there, I think we've done a lot to raise awareness already. Maybe it would have happened by itself, but we, we've added a little bit of good stuff to get the word out there. Um, but and collaboration, I think, is a wonderful word. Some people don't like it. It has a negative connotation from World War II still, believe it or not. But we've got to collaborate and try to figure out ways to come together and also do, you know, follow our passion and what we think is, is needed and bring it all together somehow. I, um, I don't know. I don't know how much time is left. No, we, we, are, we have... Is we have, another we, question? Yeah, we still, we still have two, two minutes uh, to close down, so I can leave that to you, Deborah, please. Okay, thank you, Antonio. 
Um, Lauren, um, we, you know, I, I'm still very optimistic about the future and what technology could do to um, help us solve some of these gaps. Um, it, as, as you noted earlier in the interview, um, being social is being human. And I, I remember when I, I visited Spain and I can't speak Spanish, I, um, I think I'm so funny. Not everybody else thinks so, but I, I normally am like quipping jokes and stuff. And um, I couldn't do that in Spain because I didn't really know how to speak the language. And I felt it, I, I really um, it, I, I didn't feel that I could be as social as I normally like to be. And um, so, and once again, as I watch my own family become impacted by deaf and hard of hearing, um, it's very real to me. So the work that you're doing at CCAC is very important and we're really thrilled to have you be here. And, and maybe a corporation will be participating and say, wow, I really should get behind CCAC or many corporations. This is a very good opportunity for multinational corporations to support organizations that are making a difference. So I hope that corporations will uh, join this conversation in supporting organizations like CCAC. But uh, Lauren, do you, would you like to um, make a final comment? And then we will um, close down the chat and we look forward to um, your Twitter chat, not tomorrow, but the following Tuesday. Any last words, Lauren? Thank you all so much, everybody and everybody watching this video next week. And um, you know, this has been, it's wonderful to talk to new people always and try to, try to um, share ideas and questions. Just a huge thanks to all of you. Okay, uh, th thank you, Lauren. It was a, an amazing experience. And uh, thank you, Deborah. I'll be uh, closing down our interview. And uh, once again, thank you so much.